Hope you're all having a great day so far. Welcome to episode 12 of my second season. Today is Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. My name is Sanal Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. I've got a lot to unpack in this episode to keep you all up to date and current. So let's get into it. From a very hot, newsworthy CBR, no, sadly not a tasty cinnamon bun roll, but a comparative billing report to more and more details and my trusty tips in my part three of the many smirk audits that have rolled out. And I share simply remarkable early insights from our very own cosmetics queen, Mary Kay Ash. If you've checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss an episode. Please write in a review and five-star rating on Apple Podcast, or wherever you listen to my podcast, I'd really love your support. Now, a quick disclaimer. Before I get started on the episode, this podcast episode and next Improve It podcast series do not constitute legal advice, but I am fortunate to work with sound healthcare attorneys at Next Improve It. And as their consultant, I have over 10 years of experience in front office, back end, coding, and billing for multi-specialty physicians, compliance, and auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. Again, the opinions and insights throughout are mine alone, and they in no means constitute legal advice. So, let's get into Newsworthy. A comparative billing report, CBR, is going to be issued for comprehensive eye examinations later this month by CMS. It's CBR number 202103. It's the third CBR for the year to date. Now, the focus is on eye examinations as an umbrella term, and it's used loosely throughout the CBR. But the specific CPT codes analyzed here includes CPT code 92002, which is defined as ophthalmological services, medical examination and evaluation with initiation of diagnostic and treatment program, intermediate new patient. And there's also CPT code 92004, which is defined as ophthalmological services, medical examination and evaluation with initiation of diagnostic and treatment program, comprehensive new patient one or more visits. There's also CPT code 92012, which is defined as ophthalmological services, medical examination and evaluation with initiation or continuation of diagnostic and treatment program, intermediate established patient. And finally, they're looking at CPT code 92014, which is defined as ophthalmological services, medical examination and evaluation, with initiation or continuation of diagnostic and treatment program, comprehensive established patient, one or more visits. Now, of course, the OIG has been looking at the ophthalmology specialty for quite some time. 2018 saw hits to eye injections with Lucentis and overuse. And there were also ridiculous errors found in cataract surgeries already performed on the same eye. But as usual, I digress with my many fun facts. Let's get back to the CBR. So the CBR discloses that the 2020 Medicare fee-for-service supplemental improper payment data report reflects an improper payment rate of 2.3% for the ophthalmology provider type, which represents basically $162 million in possible improper payments. Now, For eye examinations, Medicare, of course, demands proper and compliant documentation for services rendered, which of course translates to ensuring there is sufficient documentation to support the proper use 
of eye examination codes and medical necessity. It also requires code assignments that are correct, right? So be aware of code requirements and services included in intermediate and comprehensive services. Now, let's get into the rationale for why providers are going to be receiving this CPR. First, CMS will identify that you are, quote, significantly higher, end quote, compared to state or national averages or percentages in any of the metrics that they identify, like greater than or equal to the 90th percentile. Second, CMS will identify that you had at least 130 beneficiaries with claims and at least $17,000 in total allowed charges for CPT codes 92004 and 92014. Remember, and, and remember, excuse me, <clears throat> like with all CBRs and their recipients, these are the providers who have been identified with vulnerabilities in their billing patterns and they should be aware that this CBR contains an analysis of billing practices across geographic areas and serve as educational tools for possible improvements in billing and ensuring compliance. So in the analysis and results portion of the CBR, it summarizes that around 48,747 rendering providers across the country submitted claims for ophthalmological services for new and established patients. The date parameters or scope for these claims is from November 1st, 2019 through October 31st of 2020. The metrics involved with this particular CBR includes the percentage of comprehensive eye examinations, the average allowed amount per claim, and the average number of comprehensive eye examinations per beneficiary. Now, it's critical to understand a CBR does not indicate you are going to get an audit. Although please be mindful that this is the phrase directly coming from the MAX that issue the CBRs. So take that with plenty and plenty of grains of salt. More directly, consider this your notice, your warning. You are being looked at closely. Now, the value to providers is that it serves as a tool. This CBR should serve as a tool for you to look at your billing patterns compared to your peers. The value also includes the facts that specific coding guidelines and billing information will be detailed. The CBR informs providers whose billing patterns differ from those of their peers. Now, the desired behavior here is to capture proper and compliant documentation for all services rendered. So, the way they calculate their metric number one for the percentage of comprehensive eye exams is by counting the unique claims for comprehensive eye examinations. Again, those are through your CPT codes 92. 004 and 92014, and that's divided by the count of unique claims for comprehensive and intermediate eye examinations. Again, those are your CPT codes 92002, your 92012, your 92004, and your 92014. Their metric number two is for the average allowed amount per claim. It's calculated as the total allowed charge amount for comprehensive and intermediate eye exams. Again, your CPT codes 92002, 92012, 92004, and 92014. And that's divided by the total number of unique claims for comprehensive and intermediate eye exams. And their third metric is for the average number of comprehensive eye examinations per beneficiary. It's calculated as the total number of unique claims for comprehensive eye examinations. Again, th those are only your two CPT codes, 92004 and 92014, and that's divided by the total number of unique beneficiaries for comprehensive eye examinations. Again, those are the same two codes. The CBR provides a provider trends chart as well that visually shows the increase in volume over years one through three for CPT code 92004. So that's a trend up, right, in year three. That's what their visual chart is showing us. Again, this is where their aggregate 
data comes from, right? This is where they populate it from. It's from the data. It's from the volume. So let's pay attention. So remember, it's incredibly, incredibly important to self-audit here in this specialty of medicine, in ophthalmology. Are you really following the underlying definitions of the CPT codes? Be mindful because they include a lot, a lot of extra services. And now it's time for my best practice tips in trusty tip. Now, I'm carrying on with my compliance tips here in part three of my smirk audits that are blasting in. Remember, these are the 16 new Unified Program Integrity Contractor, the UPIC audits, that are being conducted via the Supplemental Medical Review Contractor, the SMIRC, at Noridian. Their function is to conduct nationwide medical reviews of Parts A, B, and DME providers and suppliers as directed by CMS. It's the responsibility of the SMIRC to review medical records and related documentation to ensure that claims are processed in accordance with CMS guidelines. Now, I provided you with details for two audits in prior episodes that involves durable medical equipment, or DME, supplies in non-covered skilled nursing facilities known as SNFs, as well as spinal cord stimulators that are in the SMIRC's spotlight. So let's get into my part three of SMIRC audits. The third is titled 01-020 Outpatient Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy, also known as HBO or HBOT, Notification of Medical Review. Now, Noridian SMIRC is conducting post-payment reviews of claims for Medicare's Part B of A, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, again, HBO or HBOT, billed on dates of service from January 1st, 2018 through December 31st of 2018. Remember, these are their time parameters. This notification includes the reasons for the review, documentation that will be requested in the additional documentation request letters, the ADR letters, and resources that providers or suppliers may wish to consult with when they're submitting claims. Now, some background on the why. Why on earth is this happening? Now, over the years, HBO therapy services have formed the basis of several, quite a few, OIG reports. So we've all been well aware, I know I've been well aware, that there have been many issues at large with the OIG based on these prior findings reports, right? Findings from these OIG reports note that Medicare beneficiaries received treatments for non-covered conditions. These reports also highlight that medical documentation did not adequately support treatments. And the reports also find that Medicare beneficiaries received more treatments than were considered medically necessary. Now, recent OIG findings in two 2018 reports have noted that documentation frequently did not support medical necessity of the services. So based on these findings, additional medical reviews were recommended, and that's why the SMIRC is doing this. So of course, the reason for the review is critical. Now, the SMIRC is narrowing it down for us in scope, thank goodness. The scope involves Noridian performing data analysis and conducting medical reviews. Noridian will complete data analysis and review activities in accordance with applicable statutory, regulatory, and sub-regulatory guidance. They are honing in, of course, on documentation requirements. I'm going to go over a list of 19 specific, very specific documentation requirements that will also be listed in your ADR letters. Now, these are the items that you will have to furnish to support your claims that have already been paid and are now under post-payment review. So the first is for the history and physical examination. At a minimum, your documentation should include prior medical and or surgical interventions, as well as previous HBOT treatments. Now, the second is for the physician or non-physician practitioner's order for the date of service. 
The third is for the diagnosis related to the provision of HBOT and all other related services to include the onset date of diagnosis. Now the fourth is for the initial evaluation and re-evaluations as well. The fifth is for progress or attendance records for each visit build. That will also need to include a description of the physical findings, as well as the types of treatments provided, as well as the number of treatments provided, as well as the effect of the treatment received, as well as the assessment of any progress that was made, as well as the treatment time to support any units that were billed. Now, the sixth is for the documentation of the procedure logs, which need to include the ascent time, the descent time, and the pressurization levels. Now, I've seen lots of HBOT service documentation over the years, and what that means is they want to know about those dives, right? Um, those treatments are called dive sessions for HBOT. So it needs to include that ascent time when they're going down for the descent time when they're coming back up is, is for the ascent. And then what levels of pressurization are there? All of that should be documented. Now, the seventh is for all pertinent radiology and lab reports per HBO national coverage determinations, those NCDs, as well as our local coverage determination, those LCDs, if they're applicable. Now, the eighth is for evidence that the wound has been evaluated at least every 30 days for signs of significant improvement. The ninth, if there's diabetic wounds, there needs to be evidence that previous standard treatments failed after, or, excuse me, <clears throat> after a minimum treatment time of 30 days, as well as evidence that the wound meets the Wagner grade three criteria. Now, the 10th, if the diagnosis is, is for necrotizing fasciitis, there needs to be lab reports that confirm the diagnosis or diagnoses are required and must be present as support for payment of HBOT. Now, the 11th is for osteomyelitis. There needs to be x-ray findings and bone cultures confirming the diagnosis are required and must be present as support for payment of HBOT. The 12th, if there's gas gangrene, you need to submit x-ray findings and lab reports to support the presence of the condition. The 13th, for radionecrosis, there needs to be documentation of the date and the anatomical site of prior radiation treatments. Now, along the same vein, check out an article I published in AAPC's Healthcare Business Magazine way back in August of 2019. Now, for number 14, for skin grafts, you need to be able to provide documentation that supports the date of the skin graft, as well as compromised stats of the graft site. The 15th, any and all other documentation as required per the HBOT NCD or LCDs if they're applicable. Now the 16th, you must also have full detailed itemizations of services, including the revenue codes. Now the 17th is for legible handwritten physician and or other clinician signatures, right? So if they're illegible, you should always be providing signature logs as well as signature attestation statements should be submitted. Now for the 18th, you should have submitted valid electronic physician and or other clinician signatures. Now, if there's evidence of an electronic physician signature, you should be submitting it on, on a electronic order signature process form along with all of this other documentation to make sure that the provider's electronic ordering system is secure. And finally, the 19th, of course, is for the ABN. You wanna be providing your patients with that advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage form, if it's applicable. Now remember, these post-payment audits are a sign, a signal that something may be amiss in your documentation your coding, and your billing. These 19 requirements are a very, very good reminder that you should be improving workflows and efficiencies at your practice to ensure all documentation is being captured. So 
A better, smarter approach is one that's proactive and starts by painting a clear, rich, and vibrant medical picture the first time so your certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. And finally, in this week's inspiring quote in Spark is from our American cosmetics queen and business mogul, Mary Kay Ash. Don't limit yourself. Many people limit themselves to what they think they can do. You can go as far as your mind lets you. What you believe, remember, you can achieve. Exactly, right? We should never put restrictions on ourselves. We all have the ability to dream big, and we need this level, this level of self-belief. There is absolutely no need to limit our dreams. We all have the right to dare to dream, dare to lead, dare to be great, dare to greatness without any self-imposed limitations. I'm happy Mary Kay's spark still burns brightly in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. Spring has sprung and my favorite March Madness has started up. I'm obsessed with filling out my brackets literally every year, except for last year, of course, because of the pandemic. I was heartbroken. But now, haha, the joke's on me. My brackets already busted, already busted. My boys were robbed, as I always say, or the games are rigged. I love to say that too. Anyways, I also got word via email that now my county has its very first case of the P1 Brazil variant of COVID-19. Yikes. Ouch. I know I'll continue doing my part to stay safe though. And regardless, I know I'm still very much looking forward to getting my vaccine in just a few months. So please remember to keep masking up, washing up, and staying physically distant. We're not in the clear yet. Please go out and make this a great day, an incredible week for yourselves. Aim a little higher, do a little more, and give back in any way you can in 2021. There's so much each one of us can do. As always, I appreciate you diving into today with me. And if you would like to inquire about my consultant services, you can always reach me through my email address at nexonpruitt.com. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Please continue staying safe and healthy, practice safety for one and all during our collective life in the time of coronavirus. Thank you for listening in on today's episode, and I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.